right, right. We couldn't get tickets, so we figured you were second best. I made the donation in your name. Thank you. Oh, dear. We just run through Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Not a bad response, but I'm still going to try it one more time. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. All right, that's a lot better. That's how I like it. All right, welcome to the library. On behalf of the entire library team, my name is Ray Andrade, a proud LMU alumnus who now serves you as your programming librarian. So again, welcome to the library. Um, tonight, you're, you're in for a, for a treat with the March edition of Faculty Pub Night, where we are going to feature Professor of Theological Studies, Professor Amir Hussein, who will be discussing, discussing his book, Muslims and the Making of America. But before we begin the program, just a few words about Faculty Pub Night. Um, number one, it is not for faculty only. So you students who found out about this event, thank you for coming, and please spread the word to your friends. Yes, shout out to the students. Um, also, the event, yes, it's called a pub night, but it's pub as in publication night. So it is not necessarily 21 and over. We do have a bartender, Eric, shout out to Eric. So he will be carting people, so if you're under 21, please try not to be slick. You will get it. <laughs> so um, this event is considered a casual event. So in the words of Theological Studies Professor Brett Hoover, the format is chill, okay? <laughs> so at any point, if you want to grab some food and drinks, please, you're more than welcome to do so at any point. Um, Q&A. There will be time for Q&A at the end of the program, so please hold your questions until the end. And we will have books for sale as well. So there is another Eric in the house from the bookstore. Thank you, Eric. So he has copies of Amir's book for sale tonight. And lastly, there are some feedback forms on your chair. So if you please fill out these feedback forms, that would really help out the library outreach department. Dr. Dean of the library, Chris Brantolini, is modeling the form. Thank you, Dean Brantolini. And students, if, well, anybody, if you also include your email address, you will be entered into a raffle for a $100 Amazon gift card. So students, that's a down payment on the textbook right there. <laughs> okay, so now, let's let the program begin. Um, here to introduce tonight's speaker is Dr. Hussein's student and senior and double major in mathematics and theological studies, Kathy Merkel. Kathy. in Theological Studies here at Loyola Marymount, where he teaches courses on Islam and other religions of the world. He received his undergraduate degree and PhD from the University of Toronto. He was the editor for the Journal of the American Academy of Religion for five years, and has previously taught at California State University, Northridge, and several universities in Canada. Dr. Hussein is an enthusiastic professor who has won several teaching awards throughout his time as a professor. His passion for theological studies, as well as Canadian references, <laughs> creates a productive and supportive learning environment. I had the pleasure of taking his freshman year seminar course during my first semester here at LMU, titled Islam and the Building of America. Since then, Dr. Hussain has been a mentor to me, helping me to grow in my love for the study of religion and encouraging me along the way. He allowed me to help with research and editing and introduced me to the world of theological scholarship. Muslims in the Making of America explores the history of Muslim Americans and their influence on American culture. In our modern society, there seems to be a common belief that Muslims and Islam are foreign to the U.S. Muslims in the Making of America refuse this by describing the presence and contributions of American Muslims throughout this nation's history, highlighting Muslims in sports, music, and business who have not only added to American culture, but also become American icons and legends. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Amir Hussein. Uh, thanks to Kathy for that, I mean, for that uh, lovely uh, introduction. Uh, Joan and I don't have a kid, but it was lovely to have you know Kathy, as she said, as a first semester freshman in one of my classes, uh, working on what would become this book. And you know, it was great to be able to say, okay, you know, I think I taught you how to do some research skills in the fashion seminar. Let's let's see if that's we can actually put that into practice. Do you want to be my research assistant for this book I'm working on? And so Kathy's actually thanked in the book uh, for the work that she uh, did. And, you know, which is great to be able to sit and talk with her about come to the library, do some work, 
on the history of Muslims in America on slaves. What do we know? You're a smart person. You do the research. Uh, <laughs> she decided to follow the, uh, the the big money and not go do a PhD in, in theology, but do a PhD in, in math. So she went to UC <laughs> Santa Barbara uh, doing that. So you know, trying to trying to tell her that theology is really where it's at. But you know, math is there too. Um, and thank you all uh, for coming uh, to this. Thanks to. Uh, Ray Andrade, uh, in particular, Carol Ravy, John Jackson, uh, Dean Brancolini from the library. Uh, it's a delight to be here. I, I grew up uh, working class poor, and one of the first things that I had was a library card. Uh, and so libraries have always been important to me, you know, because you couldn't buy books uh, as a poor kid. But you could have access to all the books you wanted. And, and so I think libraries are extraordinary, and this library uh, in particular. You know, it, one of the, the great joys for me of coming to work every day is that, you know, I'm one of those faculty members that think that the most impressive structure on a university campus should not be the basketball stadium or the football stadium, but the library, you know, and so it's great to have this physical uh, space. So thank you, Dean Brinkley, uh, for that. Um, the, the book um, has its roots in a couple of things, one of which is a poem by the Blessed Langston Hughes. Uh, some of you know his work. Uh, it's a famous poem of his called I Too, and it sort of captures for me the experience of being an American Muslim. Uh, and the poem is very short. I too, Langston writes, sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Excuse me, and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too sing America. That's really the genesis of uh, the book. It, came uh, in, um, sorry, I'm not sure how to do the, uh, I had it backwards. <laughs> I'm not good with technology. Uh, it, the idea for the book really came in uh, 2009. One of the first speeches that the newly elected President Obama made outside of the US was this speech in June in Cairo, Cairo University, where he talked about the contributions of America, excuse me, of Muslims to America, the relationship between America and Islam. And I thought, this is fascinating. You know, here's the, the President of the United States in uh, one of his first addresses outside the, the country as President, and he's talking about American Muslims fought in our war, served in our government, stood for civil rights, started businesses, taught in our universities, excelled in sports and so on. And I thought, most Americans don't know this story. You know, it's important to talk about that. You know, what are the contributions that American Muslims have made to what it means to be American? Because there's sort of two misperceptions about American Muslims. You know, one is that people think that we're a new community, that we're recently arrived here. And the first sentence of the book is, there's never been an America without Muslims. Yeah. I'll talk more about that. And the second misperception, of course, is that there's a antipathy that Islam or Muslims have to America, something that you know, our current president uh, shares. You know, if you'll remember uh, March uh, interview with Anderson Cooper on CNN, saying, you know, I think Islam hates us. Uh, it's fascinating, you know, didn't plan on giving, well, we planned on giving this talk on March 13th a while ago, didn't realize that the president would be in Los Angeles uh, uh, today. And I know some of us have to leave early for the dinner, I think that starts at seven uh, <laughs> there. And it's been a, you know, we can talk about that question and answer period, you know, tough day, uh, Rex Tillerson, you know, being fired by tweet, uh, Mike Pompeo being named like the new secretary uh, of state, uh, interesting, interesting kinds of goings on. But, you know, for Mr. Trump, very different relationship, you know. And the book came out in 2016, just before the election. As I said, the genesis of it wasn't what was happening in 2016. It was much earlier. To say, you know, here's what's going on, here's what's, what's happening. 
And you know, you want to say to Mr. Trump, well, if you think Islam hates us, you know, do you think folks like this hate us? You know, Mahershala Ali, you know, who two years ago won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for his portrayal in Moonlight. You know, if you saw this year's Oscars, you know, he was the one that gave the the award for Best Supporting uh, Actress. You know, an American Muslim, first American Muslim to have won a Oscar. Someone you could add to President Obama's list, you know, the accomplishments of American Muslims. What have American Muslims done? Well, one of us has won uh, an Oscar. You know. My great hero uh, growing up, you, know, you didn't see a lot of black and brown folks on TV in the 70s when I was growing up. My great hero was Kareem, you know, uh, playing for the great coach, you know, Coach Wooden at UCLA. Uh, Kareem won three national titles because back in the day, the NCAA had this ridiculous idea that uh, freshmen shouldn't compete, that college was hard, that you had to adjust. You know. <laughs> now they've learned the error of that and the money that can be made from freshman <laughs> athletes. Uh, but I won't say anything bad about the NCAA. Uh, it's not about that rant. Um, Kareem wins three national titles at UCLA, turns pro, uh, Six national, six NBA championships, 19-time All-Star, all-time leading scorer, you know, and he's often out of the conversation of greatest basketball player. You know, Michael Jordan, LeBron, I'm like, what about Kareem? You know, he's the leading scorer. He's got six titles. He's got 19, you know, All-Star appearances. The skyhook, you know, his signature shot. Those that remember Dan Essel there playing for the Denver Nuggets. Those wonderful uh, polychromatic uniforms. Dan is about 6'11". So you get a sense of just how tall uh, Kareem is and how you know, uh, uh, high that shot is. But what folks don't remember is that Kareem developed the skyhook because in 1967, the NCAA outlawed dunking. You know, it wasn't exclusively or only because of Kareem, you know, but that was a part of it. And you can imagine why, 67, a couple of years after the assassination of Malcolm X, a year before the assassination of Dr. King, racial, civil unrest, young black men dunking with authority, you know, caused some issues for some folks. You know. And so Kareem had to develop that shot because he couldn't dunk. You know. So what have American Muslims done? Well, they're perhaps, in my opinion, the greatest basketball player ever. And forget about the greatest basketball player ever. You know, think of Ali. You know, who died in 2016. It was one of those weird moments where, so the book was done and at the press, uh, and, and Ali passed away in June, and thankfully I was able to make some revisions uh, to it to reflect that, uh, because he's been my great hero. You know, I, I was nine years old when in those less enlightened times of the 70s, he fought uh, George Foreman in uh, what was called the Rumble in the Jungle in Zaire. <laughs> You know, and my students, you know, Kathy knows George Foreman. Well, Kathy, she does know George Foreman because she's also from Houston, uh, you know, uh, where Foreman's from. But, you know, um, they know George Foreman is this jolly, happy, lovable fat man who sells you the lean, green, uh, grilling machine. That's not the George Foreman that I knew in 75. <laughs> you know, George Foreman that I knew in 75 came out of Houston's Fifth Ward. You know, 75, probably not the nicest place to come out of. I mean, 2018, probably not the nicest place to come. No, no, just like Houston, but you know, the Fifth Ward is not a particularly pleasant place, you know. I wasn't worried that Ali would lose that fight to form. I was worried that he would die. I mean, that's how powerful George's punches were. If you don't remember that, that, that fight, and I'm speaking to the, the students in the, in the crowd, pick up a copy of um, Leon Gass's film, uh, When We Were Kings. This phenomenal film that talked about that fight in Zaire and the hoopla and the things that happened there. And that's part of what made Ali Ali. Like, you know, where did he fight? Not just here in the US, but literally all over the world. You know? But there's this moment where they're in the clinch, as boxers often do, and Ali's whispering something to Foreman. And I didn't know what that was until I watched the film, the documentary, When We Were Kings. And there's Ali whispering to Foreman, George, is that all you got, George? George, they told me you could punch. That's it, George? That's all you got? And you know, if, if, if you're involved in physical sports, martial arts, you know, press a trainer, you know, and you hit a guy with your best shot, and he just smiles at you and says, that's it? 
that's all you've got, you know it's going to be a long day. You know, there. And George is like, I can't hit Trudy harder. Why do you not go down? Everyone I hit goes down. You know, that was Ali. But it, it is physical. I mean, he was, and I'm, I'm not being hyperbolic, he was the greatest athlete I ever saw. Just the physical gifts, the strength. But then think about what he was able to do. You know, 1960, as a young man going to Rome, representing our country in the Olympics, winning a light heavyweight gold medal, coming back home to his town, Louisville, which 1960 wasn't a big thriving metropolis, you know, not served in a restaurant. You know, the Langston Hughes line, eat in the kitchen. We'll serve you in the kitchen, but we can't serve you here, in the front of the house. And this is the Olympic gold medalist. Understand that there's some issues in the country. And so he converts. He's no longer a Christian, but a Muslim. Changes his name. No longer Cassius Clay, but Muhammad Ali. A few years later, 1967, refuses induction into the Vietnam War because of his Muslim conscience. Really interesting there. That refusal in 67 was not particularly popular. Yeah. A really powerful statement as a Muslim to say, I will not go fight in this war. This war is wrong. Yeah. Challenging folks. And I come back to Ali at the end of the, the talk. But to think, you know, people like him, perhaps the most famous man in the world. You know, if you remember the funeral, you know, really powerful. Uh, Bill Clinton spoke, Billy Crystal spoke. Billy Crystal talked about, you know, uh, how Ali had helped him fundraise a scholarship that he, Billy, had set up at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And says, you know, there he was, the most famous Muslim man in the world, helping out his Jewish friend, you know, doing this. So there's a history here that we have. And it was the two of them, Kareem and Ali, that made me start thinking about that history. You know, if you know... Uh, Alex Haley in Roots. I was 12 years old when the miniseries came out. LeVar Burton playing Kunta Kinte, you know, the ancestor that Alex Haley could trace back to the slave ship that brought uh, uh, Kunta Kinte, his ancestor, to Annapolis. And he was Muslim. And I thought, Muslim? There were Muslim slaves? I never knew there were Muslim slaves. Then you start thinking, well, of course, Islam has been in West Africa since the 9th century. And he's surprised that the slaves we took from West Africa, some of them were Muslim. We estimate that at least 10% of the West African slaves were Muslim. That's what I'm talking about when I say that there's never been an America without Muslims. We've been here for centuries, you know, going back to the transatlantic slave trade. You saw that play out in some interesting ways. Anyone remember this from uh, 2010? Anyone know where this is or what this is? Downtown Manhattan. Yeah. Yeah. Lower Manhattan, 51 Park Place, what was going to be a mosque, the Cordoba Initiative. You know, it was, it was a, a, a Burlington Code factory uh, that would have been purchased by a Muslim developer. And you see at the bottom the protest. People's calling it not the Cordoba Initiative, but the Ground Zero Mosque. They're going to build a mosque on Ground Zero. How can they build a mosque on Ground Zero? You know, this is sacred ground. It was 19 Muslims that took down the trade, World Trade Center. How can we build a uh, a mosque here that celebrates that. And you want to say, okay, sacred ground. That's an interesting concept. You know, if it's the dead that make the ground sacred, what about the dead that have been there centuries before? You know, if you go to Lower Manhattan, I would certainly encourage you to go see uh, the 9-11 memorial and go see the museum. I've, I've been to the memorial since it was constructed. I haven't been to New York since the museum uh, opened, and so I'm, I'm interested in going to see the the 9-11 Museum, but I would encourage you to go six blocks away from the memorial on uh, Duane Street in Lower Manhattan, the African Burial Ground National Monument, declared a national monument by President Bush, George W. Bush, in 2006, opened in 2007. You know, the middle picture there, the black and white one, was the, basically the, the discovery uh, it's 1991, you know, they're doing some work in Lower Manhattan, as they're always doing work in Lower Manhattan, and they discover this burial ground. It's a massive burial ground. And they realize what they discovered. It's a burial ground for African slaves. 
some of whom were African Muslim slaves. We know this through the, you know, the kinds of uh, objects with which they were buried. Yeah. Where I'm going with this is, so if it's the dead that makes this place sacred, what about the dead who've been there for centuries? You know, the fact that you've got a monument to the African slaves who were literally buried you know, six blocks away from ground zero. Yeah. So then the youth at uh, the Schomburg Center is the woman that's really done the most work on uh, African Muslim slaves. She's extraordinary and uh, teaches a course called uh, Muslim Roots of the Blues, you know, uh, where she starts with a field recording of uh, Alan Lomax, you know, one of the first blues field recordings of Bloody Camp Hollow, and then plays the call to prayer. It's the same melody. She's like, is this coincidental? Or is it the fact that we know that one of the roots of uh, American blues is West African blues? And we know that Islam is the dominant religious tradition in West Africa. And he's surprised that some of those people that were brought over weren't just you know, West African musicians, were West African Muslim musicians who brought this along with them. She's done a number of books. These are just a couple of them. Uh, Servants of Allah, the, the top one is probably the most uh, famous one, the, the image on the cover there is um, Ayuba Suleiman Diallo, uh, Joel bin Solomon, uh, brought as a slave to Annapolis in 1730. Uh, gets his freedom partly because his slave owner recognized that he's literate, um, ends up making his way to England. The Reverend Thomas Blewett, who's an Anglican clergyman, uh, writes a book about him that's published in England in 1734. Those of you that know your American history, in 1734, General Washington is two years old. You know, so when George Washington, the father of our country, is a toddler, people in England are reading about an African Muslim slave in the Americas. You know, that history is really powerful, but that history is often ignored. Um, I don't know if folks remember uh, this film. Uh, Julie Dash, in 1991, did a film called uh, Daughters of the Dust, which was the first major theatrical release by an uh, African-American woman director. You, know, you think these days about uh, Ava DuVernay, for example, you know, doing Wrinkle in Time, or uh, the sort of hoopla around um, Black Panther, you know, or Jordan Peele with Get Out. You know. Well, this was over 25 years ago that she did this film. Um, it got a 25th anniversary restoration because one of the people that was influenced by the film, and I'm going to look at the students because the students will have no idea about this film, but they'll know who I'm talking about. Because one of the people that watched this film and got really inspired by this film was a young woman named Beyonce. <laughs> when she did the video for Lemonade, that's basically an homage to Daughters of the Dust. Daughters of the Dust is this film about African Muslim women slaves, the Gullah people, you know, who uh, are in Georgia and South Carolina, descendants of Muslims there. And the way that Beyonce did that, which, without sort of, uh, uh, publicly acknowledging in any kind of way, but anyone that's seen the, the two can put that together, is the structure of Lame is really based on the structure of this film and some of the scenes at the beginning are sort of shot for shot sort of uh, redos of, of this film. And so Julie was able to get you know, the film uh, re-released. It's gotten some really good press in the last couple of years. So it's fascinating that you know, 25 years later, your work sometimes gets picked up uh, by folks. So that's uh, Julie's phenomenal, phenomenal uh, director here. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know, you know Julie or Solan, you know this gentleman, you know, our third president, you know, Mr. Jefferson, who in 1765 purchased a Quran, you know, this Quran, that's actually now uh, in the Library of Congress. You know, one of my mentors, uh, Jane McAuliffe, phenomenal, phenomenal uh, scholar, and uh, Jane went to Georgetown to be dean at Georgetown, you know, when Bob Lawton left Georgetown to become president uh, here. Uh, Jane was one of my mentors at, at Toronto, was on my dissertation committee, and she and her husband Dennis now are, are retired. They live out in D.C. where they're both from. She now directs the Kluge Center, which is the scholar center at the Library of Congress. And it's always a delight 
to you know, get a tour with the director there. Because there's the Library of Congress has some pretty cool stuff uh, there. And so to be able to see and to hold you know, the, the Quran that Tom, Thomas Jefferson in 1765 owned, and then you know, sold it. And Jefferson was smart in lots of ways. That, um, it was in the 1820s, I think, is when he sort of sold his library to what would become the Library of Congress. <laughs> and he sold it for like $28,000. And I'm like, I'm an economist, but what was $28,000 in 1820 worth like now? Like that, that's, that's a, not an insignificant sum of money here, but we're not talking about Mr. Jefferson's business uh, acumen. But the fact that you know, he gets this Quran. Now Jefferson is no fan of Islam. You know, Jefferson's not trying to convert. But when you're writing a document that's kind of important, Declaration of Independence, sort of nice to have a comparative framework. Jefferson knew European law, English and French law. He wanted to learn about the other legal system, which of course in the uh, 18th century was Islam. So he wants to learn about Islam and Muslims. You know. When he does the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, which becomes the First Amendment to the Constitution, you know, it's about religious freedom for all religions. You know, in the modern period, we start hearing about this as, no, 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 this is really about religious freedom for Christians. Like, no, that's not what Mr. Jefferson had in mind. It wasn't just for Anglicans and Baptists. It was for Muslims, Hindus, Catholics, Jews, infidels, whoever. Yeah. The book, uh, just to bring it back to that, is dedicated to two uh, people. One of them you already met, Muhammad Ali. And the other one you may not know, but is you know one of my great heroes, and that's uh, Emmett Erdogan. Um, Emmett died in 2006 at the age of 83. <laughs> sort of slip and fall, which, which sounds tragic and, you know, in some ways it could be, except in Ammon's case. You know, his slip and fall occurred backstage at the Beacon Theater, Upper West Side of New York City, Rolling Stones concert <laughs> that was going to be filmed by Marty Scorsese for one of Marty's documentaries on the Stones, Shine a Light. So Shine a Light is shot over two days, the, 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 the concert was over two days, I mean, that concert day for two days. Um, and you're thinking, what's going on here? You know, well, Anna was backstage, a little too much to drink. Um, if you find yourself backstage with the Stones, don't go shot for shot with Keith, especially <laughs> when you're 83. It's not going to go well. You know, a little too much to drink, hits his head, never regains consciousness, dies a couple of days later. As a theologian, you know, thinking about death and where that comes from and what that means, if I have to die, I'm not sure I have to die, uh, but if I have to die at 83 backstage with the Stones before a show that Marty Scorsese is going to film, pretty good way to go out. You know, why is this guy in the top pictures? You know, him with, uh, with Nick. You know, why is this guy backstage with the Stones? Well, because this is the guy that created Atlantic Records and Rolling Stones records were distributed to Atlantic Records. This was a guy at the bottom, you know, with a sort of a impossibly young Jimmy Page there, because you know he signed Led Zeppelin to Atlantic Records. This was the guy who created Atlantic Records, you know, with his Jewish friend, uh, uh, well, two Jewish friends, uh, Jerry Wexler and Herb Abramson, you know, with a loan from their dentist. <laughs> you know, it's kind of an interesting story, but you know, uh, and Erdogan was the son of Mehmet Menir Erdogan, who was the second ambassador of the Republic of Turkey to the United States. So he'd come in the 1930s with his dad, found uh, uh, DC in the 1930s, deathly boring, went across the, the river to some of the black neighborhoods, especially by the Howard University, got interested in the music that folks were listening to, which at the time, in the 30s and 40s, that was race music. You know, black folks listened to that music, white folks didn't. He creates this record company. You know, and I don't think you can understand, and I would say the history of America in the 20th century, not just the history of American music, I would say the history of America in the 20th century without the impact of Atlantic Records. The R&B sides of the 50s, the soul sides of the 60s. You know, Sine and Ray Charles uh, for a period of time uh, and wrote Mess Around for the Genius. You know, uh, Chairman of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, American Muslim. We think about the building of America. We think about the musical history of America. You know, and it continues to this day. These fine young gentlemen you know, from uh, the world of hip hop and rap. You know, RZA on the left, Buster Rhymes in the middle, uh, 
uh, most of you see there on the top, uh, Talib Kuli at the bottom, Lupe Fiasco on the end. All of them are Muslim. All of them are either born in Muslim families or convert to Islam. And I would say that the secret language of, of rap and hip hop is really Islam. You know, if you saw like Straight Outta Compton, you know, the film about NWA, Ice Cube's Muslim. You know, RZA from uh, Wu Tang Clan. Most of the guys from Wu Tang Clan are Muslim. You, know? you don't think about that when you think about American Islam, and yet that's there. And not just men, uh, of course. Female Muslim rappers, hijabi Muslim rappers, misunderstood from Queens. That's part of what I'm talking about. You know the the impact that American Muslims had on America. You know, a couple more things, and we'll finish up. Um, President Obama in his text talked about they built the tallest buildings. Well, this is what he was talking about. You know, uh, Fazlur Rahman Khan, a structural engineer from Bangladesh, came to America. Uh, went to the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, got a job working with Skidmore Merrill Zoning. You know, he was the structural engineer behind the John Hancock building, behind the Sears Tower. He was the one that made the construction of those very tall buildings possible, you know, the sort of tubular construction. He came up with that uh, idea. He wasn't involved in the, in the design of the World Trade Center, but the design of the World Trade Center was based on his kind of work to be able to do these 100-plus these, you know, story buildings. And to think about that, that yeah, there was 19 Muslims that took down the World Trade Center, but it was one Muslim who made possible the construction of these kinds of buildings. You know? And the architecture is sort of fascinating uh, here. Um, those of you who are from here probably know this uh, image, but I talk about this in the book, where a friend of mine uh, got a scholarship to go to USC about a decade ago, knew there was a mosque across the street, walks across Jefferson on Friday afternoon, goes to this building, which of course he thinks is the mosque, you know, and tries the door and the door is closed. And he's like, what kind of mosque is closed on a Friday afternoon? You know? And he's sort of pulling at the door hard enough that he attracts the attention of security guard who comes around the corner. Excuse me, sir, can I help you? I'm trying to get in the mosque for Juma prayer, my friend says. Sir, this is not the mosque. What do you mean this is not the mosque? What is this? This is the Shrine Auditorium. <laughs> What's the Shrine Auditorium? It's a long story, the security guard says. You know. The mosque is across Vermont. You know. And so it's just, but it's that sense, you can think like, you can understand why someone would think, this is a mosque, this looks like a mosque. You know, The fascination in America with sort of Islamic uh, architecture you know, here, especially after the discovery of, of King Tut's tomb, the Shriners, all kind of thing, we can go into that in the Q&A, but you have these interesting, interesting kinds of things, you know. I'm just smiling as I'm thinking of this building of, there was a time when our president didn't think that Islam hated us, because his signature casino <laughs> in Jersey, the Trump Taj Mahal, you know, named after one of the most iconic buildings in the Muslim world, you know, the Taj Mahal, and not a mosque, the Taj Mahal's a mausoleum, but you know, he named it that, it's so interesting. Um, speaking of our dear president, um, I'm going to end on, on this uh, note, which I think is really powerful. So last year, January 27th, I was actually in D.C. I do work, uh, Kathy mentioned the American Academy of Religion, I do work with the American Academy of Religion uh, on public understanding of religion. We were in D.C. for a project. And so I fly to D.C. on the 27th of January, Friday. You know, I land open up my email and discovered that, you know, at 4.42 that afternoon, President Trump had issued the first iteration of the travel ban. You know, going to the meeting on the Saturday and talk about this, and they said, yeah, did, did you hear his remarks on International Holocaust Remembrance Day? I'm like, no, what happened? So we'll go back and read it. So January 27th is International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And that's when Mr. Trump very infamously, you know, talked about the Holocaust without mentioning by names, Jews, as victims of the Holocaust. You know. And I'm thinking, but he knows Jared's Jewish, right? Like, he knows Ivanka is Jewish. He knows the grandkids are Jewish, you know? And so it wasn't surprising that, you know, a couple hours later, you could do the first iteration of the travel ban. You know, what was fascinating was the next day, the this, this Sunday, coming back from uh, DC, landing at LAX, and Joan normally picks me up, you know, uh, from LAX in the evenings. That's the one time she couldn't pick me up 
because at 9 o'clock when the flight landed, the LAX was still closed because of the protests that had started like at noon that day. And where I'm going with this slide is, for me, that's been one of the sort of unintended consequences, I think, of the Trump presidency has been the connection between Muslims and Jews. Because, you know, the, the people at the forefront of the, uh, the, the travel ban and the protests at the airport were American Jews, you know, who very well know where this road leads, who understand that the commandment that is repeated more than any commandment of the Torah is, do not oppress the stranger, for you are what strangers in the land of Egypt. And to see, you know, this kind of support. I, I've been doing work with the Jewish community here since I came to LA 21 years ago. I've never seen the relationships, you know, as good as they are uh, in the last year, uh, you know, in the last year. And of course, not just folks in the Jewish community. You know, many of us remember this iconic Shepherd Ferry uh, uh, poster here. You know, the We the People is a triptych. You know, uh, Latina, a young girl, and then uh, this woman in the uh, American flag hijab. We the people are greater than fear. And I think that level of solidarity and support has been really heartening for folks you know, in the Muslim community. But I'm going to end um, where I began with Muhammad Ali and the funeral of Ali. You know, Ali had this wonderful sort of Muslim funeral on the Friday, on the Saturday. It was a public funeral. One of the people that's like I mentioned, you know, uh, uh, President Clinton spoke, Billy Crystal spoke, a lot of other celebrities. But one of the people that spoke there was uh, Ambassador Tala Shabazz. Tala Shabazz is the oldest daughter of Betty Shabazz and Al Haj Malik Al Shabazz, also known as Malcolm X. Yeah. Uh, was appointed an ambassador, not not from our country, but by, by the country of Belize. So that's where the, the ambassador title uh, comes from. But she spoke at the funeral of Muhammad Ali. Because Muhammad Ali was brought into the nation of Islam by his friend, her father, Malcolm X. And it's just this amazing, amazing sort of eulogy. At the very end of her remarks, this is almost exactly where she ended. You know. I'm going to read that to you. Uh, As the last fraternity reaches the heavens, my heart is, ever rendered, is rendered ever longingly for that tribe, tribe of purpose, Tribe of significance, tribe of confidence, tribe of character, tribe of duty, tribe of faith, tribe of service. We must make sure that the principle of men and women like Muhammad Ali and others who dedicate their very being to ensure that you get to recognize your own glory is sustained and passed on like that Olympic torch. My dad would often say, of course, my dad is not the max. My dad would often say, when concluding or concluding parting from one another, May we meet again in the light of understanding. And I say to you with the light of that compass, by any means necessary, you know, one of her dad's famous uh, lines there. Which is that sense of, of connection and what Ali meant. How he, as an American Muslim, was able to change America. Able to make America see some things that America, I don't think, was ready to see in the 60s, in the 70s. You know, President Obama talked about they have lit the Olympic Cauldron. That's what he's talking about. Uh, Ali. This is 2002 in Salt Lake City. You know, Ali is one of those rare people to have lit the cauldron at both uh, Summer and Winter Olympics. 1996. You remember the Atlanta Games? Yeah. Janet Evans actually was the, the the person that had the torch last. You know, this phenomenal swimmer from right here in Southern California. You know, and we all thought I was in Canada. But we all thought, okay, this is really cool because Janet's gonna uh, light the cauldron. And in the best kept secret in the Atlanta Games, you know, there's this curtain, and there's Ali, and he's you know, holding the torch, in this hand, this hand shaking, with the Parkinson's, and he's silent, you know, a man who made his living as much with his body as, as his mouth, you know, what do you do when both of those go, when you can't, you know, do the kinds of things when your body is literally shaking from the Parkinson's, when you're not able to speak, you know, but just that power. And those of you who have ever seen that, completely silenced the place. That's Ali. That's Ali. Yeah. And then 2002, same thing, we lit the torch in the Salt Lake City Games. And so you think about, it, for me, that's the contribution. Yeah. That's Ali. You know, we're talking about America. It doesn't get more American than this. You know, the most famous man in the world is what? An American Muslim, an African American Muslim. That's part of that history that I write about in the book. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr.
saying we have approximately 20 minutes for Q&A. If there's anybody who wants to start us off, I'll be more than happy to pass along a microphone. Hi. Thanks. That was a lot of fun. And I got, there were some examples. I didn't. I, the Shriners Auditorium is my personal favorite. <laughs> Um, I was curious, you moved back and forth pretty freely between American Islam and uh, people who were in our part of the nation of Islam. And I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit more on how you see that relationship. Yeah. Th thank you, uh, Professor Captain Osborne and our department. So thank you for that uh, uh, question. Um, and I, in the book, I talk about the nation of Islam, you know, because when uh, Muhammad Ali uh, joins, it's the nation of Islam, you know. Uh, for someone like him, it very much was a the the it, the conversion to Islam was a political act as much as any kind of spiritual thing. For someone like Kareem, you know, Kareem never joined the Nation of Islam. Kareem came to sort of Sunni Islam, and Kareem has talked about how, literally, in his last book, and, and one of the reasons I love the brother is he's written like over a dozen books. You know, like there's athletes that haven't read a dozen books. Like Kareem's <laughs> written, you know, more than a dozen. But the latest is becoming Kareem, where he talks about sort of you know what he learned during the civil rights struggle, but he talks about this as a spiritual conversion, you know, not as a political one. But absolutely, so the Nation of Islam is this fascinating American phenomenon of religion that, you know, is, is, is here, and meaning here in the US and only here, uh, founded by Wallace Fard, sort of taken over by Elijah Muhammad, and then really popularized by Malcolm X, you know, who uh, is this extraordinary sort of public speaker long before the age of you know social media or anything, but understanding Dick Gregory once very famously said, you know, Malcolm X knew what soundbites were anyone else knew what soundbites, <laughs> you know, were to be able to, you know, say these kinds of things uh, uh, on camera. Um, but then in nineteen seventy five and, and when Malcolm X left the nation of Islam, you know, Ali to to literally to his dying day, you know, that was one of his great regrets was that he was brought into the nation of Islam by uh, uh, Malcolm X. When Malcolm left the nation, he sort of broke with Malcolm because he stayed with Elijah Muhammad. One of the things Malcolm was talking about was Elijah Muhammad was doing all sorts of nasty things with, with his secretaries having children uh, 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 by them and you know, just not living the moral life that he wanted others to, to do. Um, in 1975, Elijah Muhammad dies, and his son, uh, Warath Deem, Wallace Muhammad, changed his name to Warth Muhammad, really brings the nation of Islam into Sunni orthodoxy. So there's a, this is a long, you know, a second to your question. Between 75 and 85, that's really when the nation of Islam sort of gets brought into Sunni orthodoxy. And so the practice is, because the nation of Islam had ministers, not imams, they worshiped in temples, not mosques. The worship kind of looked like this, you know, like a, a, a Protestant service where you're sitting in chairs listening to a, a, a speaker rather than a Muslim, you know, standing and bowing and, and reading the Quran and doing those kinds of things. And so over that 10 year period, uh, War of Muhammad really brings the nation of Islam into Sunni orthodoxy. So the folks that had joined uh, the nation really got brought into sort of the mainstream Sunni uh, tradition. Um, Louis Farrakhan in 77 sort of gets upset with, uh, with uh, Wallace Worth Muhammad and declares his intention to restart the nation of Islam on the principles of Elijah Muhammad. So Farrakhan has, has done that and is still uh, very much with us. So the nation of Islam still exists under the leadership of Louis Farrakhan. My own sense is it's somewhere between 20 and 30,000, like if you're gonna do a big number, it's probably 30,000 members of the nation of Islam under Farrakhan's leadership as compared to the sort of a million and a half, at least, African-American Muslims. So African-Americans are one of the largest groups of American Muslims. You know, American Muslims, about a third of us are South Asian. People like me from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. About a third of us are Middle Eastern. But Middle Eastern, especially this time, could be an Iranian, could be an Arab, could be Turkish. Uh, at least a quarter to possibly a third are African. Uh, American, almost all of whom are members of the nation. Now, the nation, of course, tells its own uh, sort of story. Uh, and, you know, and, and as a scholar of religion, you can sort of step back from the sort of faith claim to say, well, this is what it was meant to be, to say, you know, here's what the nation says. Well, it was always meant to be like this. The, you know, had Elijah Muhammad preaching in 1940 about these kinds of things, people wouldn't have listened. He had to start it here in order to bring the people there. Now, that's always a fascinating sort of argument, you know, as a scholar of religion, to say, well, okay, is that just sort of explaining things away uh, and how much it really did change between 75 and 85? 
the nation of Islam, I think, is one of these these, these fabulous. Uh, I mean, that and the Mormon tradition as sort of you know indigenous American religious uh, traditions. Thank you. How would you present this information to a group of perhaps more hostile people that might say, okay, you're presenting this history, but I consider this fake news? Yeah, yeah. No, and, and that's always sort of, you know, in some ways, you know, it, you, let me start that again. Let's just say that there hasn't been a presentation that I've made in the last couple of years, by which I mean like, you know, 15, uh, where you haven't gotten some sort of hostile question, that kind of thing, and so you get that from different audiences uh, there. I think at some level, you know, there are folks you simply can't convince with that, you know. Uh, I, I used to be naive and think that you could change people's minds just by presenting them with, you know, uh, the facts, and some of you who don't even know this story, it wasn't when I was here, it was when I was teaching at Cal State Northridge, I got into a discussion uh, about race with a sort of younger colleague in, in our psychology department, of all things. And you know, sh she had come from a particular place in the South, uh, white person. And we were talking about the Klan. She says, well, you know, the Klan never really did anything bad. And I'm like, <laughs> what did you just <laughs> say? Like, well, you know, the Klan never really did anything bad. And I, and I was going to say, but you know there's like a site called clanwatch.com that lists all, and not just the recent, forget about it, but then I realized, you know, that's not going to work. Like, I can't, I can't present here with a list of, you know, here are the number of people that literally have been killed by the clan, or sort of hate crimes that have been committed, you know, that kind of thing. That's not going to work. But it's a visceral uh, kind of thing. And I think in that way, the, the way that I sometimes go about it is, you know, who are American Muslims? Well, 60% of over 60% of Americans, when asked, We'll say, I don't know a Muslim. You know, the pure form of religion public life is you know, where I'm getting that, that, that data from. Um, and you want to say, yeah, it's kind of like the LGBTQ community, because you know, people say, well, I don't know a Muslim. In the same way, they'll say, I don't know anyone that's gay. <laughs> yeah, you know someone that's gay, you just don't know that they're gay. You know, you know someone who's Muslim, you just don't know that they're Muslim. And so who are Muslims in this country? Well, a quarter of us are small business owners. You know, when I speak um, in places that have a small Muslim population, folks will say, you know, well, we'd like to do some work with Muslims, but there's no mosque in our community. And I say, well, is there a chamber of commerce in your community? Because there's probably some Muslims who own businesses that are part of that. Is there a hospital in your community? Because I bet you I've never seen a hospital without some Muslim doctors or nurses. You know, is there a university in your community? Because particularly in like science and engineering, for some reason Muslims are you're drawn to like engineering. You know, there's going to be some engineering professors. I can guarantee you. You know, <laughs> who are Muslims uh, there. Is that, but you know, do you talk to your engineering professor about religion? Do you talk to your cardiologist about religion? Do you talk to, you know, your, the business owner about religion? Or do you just, you know, not do that? And I think for me, that, that's sometimes the way to get into those kinds of, of conversations to talk about the sort of, I don't mean to say like positive contributions in a trite uh, sort of way, but to think that, you know, American Muslims are an American success story. You know, educated, wealthy, coming here, working hard, precisely because they may not have had the opportunities in the countries of, of origin, you know. Um, but again, that doesn't work for folks who, in a very visceral way, think of, you know, the stranger as the one who brings the problems, as if somehow we were, we were pure and we had no issues until those people, whoever those people, are. Uh, it's particularly painful for me, you know, when I get those kinds of responses from Catholic settings. You know, one of the research projects that Kathy's working with me on is the way in which Catholics were treated in the 19th century and the way in which Muslims are treated in the 21st century. You know, exactly the same kind of thing. You know, these foreigners who come to this country who won't obey our laws, who have their own authority, who bring their violence, who bring their strange customs, their languages, their refusal to assimilate, you know, kind of thing. And it's really interesting, you know, to think about, you know, you look at, for example, the building of St. Patrick's Cathedral, you know, in New York City. When Bishop Hughes was the bishop that, you know, uh, had that built, he had to station armed guards there, because you had Protestant mobs that wanted to tear down this thing. In, in, you know, because in New Amsterdam, who wants to have Catholics there? You know, 
Can you imagine a New York City, a Fifth Avenue without St. Patrick's? Well, when that was being built, there were a lot of folks who were opposed to that. You know? And so part of it is, is this sense of, and you don't mean to be trite about it, but is it just simply our turn as American Muslims? You know, is part of the history of this country immigration, and is part of the not so pleasant history that you know, immigrants have to sort of prove their Americanness. It's the Japanese that you know go off to fight in World War II precisely because of what happened in uh, 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 Pearl Harbor. You know that 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 sense of of showing your Americanness. And is it simply our terms Muslims have to deal with that kind of thing? Is there going to be another kind of threat that comes uh, down the road there? But I think you know in many ways it's a long answer to the question. But I don't know that you can convince folks with facts and data where so many so many of the arguments aren't intellectual things. They're they're the visceral. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation tonight. Really was meaningful. I I think I read somewhere that you spoke before Congress. Am I right? I, I spoke to the Senate. So, Senate, yeah. okay. So could you talk about that? I'd like to know more about yeah, it. Yeah, no, and that, and that was, it was kind of interesting. So, the, the, you know, the secret devious Muslim plan of, you know, uh, <laughs> doing this book was working, actually. Uh, the book is published by <laughs> Baylor University Press out of Waco. And I made a conscious decision to work with Baylor for two very different reasons. One was the, the executive director of the press, Carrie Newman, and I have been friends for uh, a decade. I really admired some of the work that he was doing. But two, to say that this is the kind, this goes back to, I think, to, to your question, that these are the kinds of, uh, uh, let me start that again. Baylor has access to folks who are the kind of folks that need to hear this, you know. Not that, that you know, folks here don't, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, folks in, in uh, LA or New York are, you know, in any way immune to the kinds of Islamophobic sorts of things that happens. But you also have to say that, you know, um, let me say that as someone who grew up in Canada, after the 2016 election, my Canadian friends, you know, all called and emailed me and said, you know, are you still going to live in America? And my stock answer was, I don't live in America. I live in Los Angeles. So, you know, like, this is the this is the multicultural cosmos. I feel more at home as someone who grew up in Toronto, in LA, than I do in parts of Canada. You know, because multicultural cosmopolitan cities are more like each other. So LA is much more like Toronto than I'm going to uh, on Thursday. I'm going to the Okanagan Valley in British Columbia, doing a, a series at a United Church there in Kelowna. Let's just say Kelowna is not a multicultural cosmopolitan. You know, uh, sort of city in the way that uh, LA is. But so where I'm going with this is, part of this was done uh, deliberately to say, you know, folks may pick up a, a book from Baylor, folks may pick up something that comes out of Waco in Texas. Baylor's distribution network in Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma is actually pretty good because of the Baptist sort of connections, and folks in those schools will pick up a book because it's a Baylor book in a way they wouldn't pick up a book if it was, let's say, a UC Press book or an NYU Press, you know, that kind of thing. And so where I'm going with that is that this was something that was actually arranged by uh, the, the press. They had done an event uh, for me a year ago uh, at the National Press Club as a, just as a you know, promotional tour kind of thing, and that went well. And a couple of their uh, alums who are uh, senators, you know, uh, were interested in doing this, and so it was fascinating to hear, you know, to, to go and speak uh, in the Senate. Number of folks from uh, the Senate, some staffers, some other kinds of folks there, and it really was, I think, a, a powerful kind of uh, experience to be able to talk with people uh, about this. Because I think, that, again, it goes back to the, the question of, you know, sometimes it's not the data that convinces folks. Sometimes it's the conversation. It's the talking about this. It's the doing this. And that, that unfortunately, the, one of the takeaways from that was that, that and I'm, I'm not at all familiar with DC politics. I've only been recently involved in, in doing things there. But everyone that I know that's there talks about just how things have become sort of toxic and to the point that, you know, one of the great Ask the Muslim what the great bars are. Uh, one of the great bars in DC 
is off the record, which is the bar at the Hay Adams Hotel. And the Hay Adams is this great place. It's literally across the street from the White House. They're marketing, and I, I don't work for them or any kind of way. Their tagline is, you know, the only thing we overlook is the White House, you know, because <laughs> they're literally, you know, across the street, and they overlook some of them overlook the White House. Um, but people talked about how they go to off the record, and that's what it was called. I mean, that's why it was called that. You go there, you have a drink, you talk, you do the kind of thing. Now, and part of this is social media thing, you can't be seen having a drink with someone from the other party, because that, you know, is, is so problematic. I think that's the real issue, you know, how do you get those kinds of conversations? And so, you know, it was a good crowd, like 100, 120 people, I think, who were there, um, and, and it worked out well. Now, now they did it on a, a panel, um, and we're actually repeating part of that panel. I'm speaking um, next week at George Washington University, uh, with Melissa Rogers, who's you know from uh, the Berkeley Center on uh, religious freedom, so she's a, a scholar on religious freedom, and so it's sort of interesting to have her talk about you know religious freedom in a sort of broader context, and then me talking about you know religious freedom for American Muslims, and so I think there's that part uh, that's quite uh, useful. But you know that that's the the work that needs to get done. Those are the conversations that you need to. Uh, to have in a funny way, uh, in order to do this, like you know, the, they they did a they named Baylor uh, did an event for me in uh, Waco, uh, which was a large public lecture. And again, you realize that you know, and I'm not saying in any disparaging way, the Waco student body, that the Baylor student body is very different from our student body. I mean, you you literally say just walking in because it was a, a large amphitheater that held maybe 300 people. And you could literally count the black and brown faces. I know because I counted them. There were four, you know. And it was like this interesting. But I'm not saying this in a negative way. I'm saying that's just you know. You would be hard pressed. You'd have to work pretty hard to create an LMU space of 300 students in which four were you know, students of color. You could do it, but it'd take a little bit of of, of doing uh, there. And then they had a nice uh, dinner for me with um, folks who were sort of friends of the press, you know, the, the donors, because, you know, presses, of course, university presses are not, you know, huge money makers, they tend to be, you know, money losers, and they're supported by the, the university. Uh, and it was really nice to see these folks, and you begin to realize that, okay, I'm probably the first Muslim they've ever encountered. You know, so just that act, you know, just that sort of sense of conversation, and, and you know, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I'm not a moron either. Uh, the, the, sort of lines I chose to read from the book at, at the gathering of donors is a line in the book, and I'll encourage you to buy this because Eric still has a couple of copies for sale uh, of the book, is a part of the book where I argue that American Muslims, hear me out on this, to, are to country music what Merle Haggard was to country music. Not, we're not Johnny Cash, we're not Hank Williams, we're not Willie, we're not Chris Christopherson, we're Merle Haggard. You know, and I think that resonated with the folks in Texas. It's like, wait, you know who Merle Haggard is, and you listen to his music, and you do that, and you can talk about, you know, the, in an intelligent sort of way. Um, I think, in many ways, that in itself was like, yeah, I'm a Muslim, and I love Merle's music. You know, now don't think Merle's Hank, I don't think Merle's Cash, I don't think Merle's Christopherson, but I think Merle's important. You know. But it's that you know kind of engagement sometimes I think is, is is what I don't mean to be you know vain here, but breaks the ice or creates those kinds of, of openings where people can then have those conversations. I mean, this happened again. I don't mean to pick on Houston, but you know, Kathy's here. Um, <laughs> my uncle about 15 years ago worked as a good Muslim engineer, uh, you know, as an engineer for Dupont, um, and got moved from like New Jersey to Houston. And he said to me, well, I'm moving to this sort of Baptist neighborhood community. What do I do? <laughs> and I said, knock on your neighbor's doors, introduce yourself to them. Said, Are you crazy? Why would I do that? I'm this you know, brown Pakistani Muslim who speaks with accent you know, kind of thing. I'm like, no, 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 no. Just knock on the doors, introduce yourself. And he trusted me, you know, knocked on the doors, introduced himself. And it was interesting because the people, uh, were a little hesitant because they'd known that you know this person had bought. They didn't know this. I mean, they they knew the name. Mr. Khalid had bought this you know house, and they knew that Mr. Khalid probably wasn't a 
you know, nice white Southern Baptist, you know, a person. But then they met him, and it's like, well, but wait a minute. You're a professional, you work for DuPont here, you're conservative, you have conservative social values, you believe in God, you read the Bible, I mean, you read your scripture, you, you, you know, you're more like us than so. It was that sense of, of, you know, that oftentimes you recognize within another person someone that's more like you. You know, I find myself more at home among certain Jewish and, and Christian organizations. I do with certain Muslim ones. I'm sure you've all had that same kind of experience where it's sort of the like minded folks may not be the folks within your own religious or ethnic or national you know, kind of tradition. And to make those kinds of, uh, of links and connections, I think, can be really. Uh, powerful, so you know, it's it's little steps uh, there that I think that I'm able to do, and then that sort of continues. Where you do this in National Press Club, you do this thing uh, here, you get invited to do uh, something else, you know, a couple months later. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Okay, actually, I have a question for you, Doctor. So, how did the opportunity to teach at a Catholic university? first show up on your radar and what were your what was your first reaction to that? And I got a bonus question for you too. If you want to answer what does it mean to be a Catholic university in the twenty first section. Well I I, I you're welcome tomorrow you're welcome. there will be a, uh, uh, a panel on that very topic that were missed by, you know uh, colleague Brian Trainer, who's the director of uh, our Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination. But it's a great story, you know, so uh, I suppose the religious answer is <laughs> I was born in a Catholic missionary hospital in Lahore, uh, St. Raphael's, uh, brought literally into the world at the hands of a nun, uh, Sister Elizabeth. And so I suppose, you know, Holy Mother Church has a way of, you know, bringing us all back to her. Uh, so maybe that, that's one uh, uh, reason. Um, I taught for eight years at Cal State Northridge, and I loved being at Northridge. I loved being in the state system, working class kid, you know, the transformative power of education, you know, all that kind of thing. Both my parents worked in factories. I'm a professor. My sister's an engineer, you know, going back to the Muslim stereotypes uh, there. Uh, and so I loved being at, at Northridge, but it was just the nickel and diming, the more with less, the more with less, you know, lack of resources, more students, fewer resources. And you're thinking, I, I can't keep doing this. And in 2005, or 2004, it would have been, um, the LMU created a position in their theological studies department, their first full-time tenure track position for a scholar of Islam. And it was funny because my friend uh, Jim Fredericks, who retired a couple years ago, Father Jim Fredericks, phenomenal, phenomenal member of our department, um, I got to know him doing, because he worked on Buddhist uh, Catholic uh, work. And I know Jim pretty much since I moved here to uh, LA in 97. And so I called up Jim and I said, Okay, you know, I see, I see the ad, which, can you tell me about LMU? Like, you know, I'm not sure what a Catholic, you know, like, do you have to be Catholic to be, you know, those kinds of very basic, ignorant kinds of things. He's like, no, 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 here's who we are, here's what we do. Are you interested in Good, I think you'd actually be a good candidate. I know your work, and I think so. I would encourage you to submit an application. And I submitted it, and, you know, got the job, and, you know, I love being here. It was uh, Mike Gang was the dean who hired me. He was now you know, the president of, of Santa Clara. And I'll never forget sitting in Mike's office, you know, as part of my interview. And he says, "Well, well you know, this is a teaching institution. You know, we have a three-three teaching load. That was our teaching load back then." And I got this smile on my face, going, "Father Eng, I'm teaching four-four at Cal State Northridge. You know, my thankfully my our big classes were fifty. They weren't like a hundred or two hundred. They were fifty. And so at Northridge, I was teaching on average about 160 students a semester. You know, when I came to LMU, the most I would teach a semester would be 90. You know, I remember my very first uh, uh, semester teaching a class that's capped at 30 students. And at Northridge, you were always encouraged to admit extra students because, you know, the, the department got sort of a percentage of the fees that the students had paid. And so if the class was capped at 50, you were encouraged to have 53, 54, 55, you know, could be more than like what the fire marshal, you know, uh, 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 had booked the room at, but you were encouraged to do that. And so my first, literally the first semester I'm here, I've got a class that's capped at 30, I add a couple of students, there's like 33 students in the class, I get a call, John Papayden was our dean, and I get a call from John Papayden, like, what are you doing? You're adding three students, and I'm thinking, why are you getting upset with me? This is a good thing. We're having like more students. No, 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 no. 
we'll open up another section, you know, rather than have you know, this kind of thing, because you know, we, we don't want these kids to have you know, classes of more than 30. In fact, we're trying to reduce it down. So it was like, I've come home. This is a place where teaching <laughs> is valued, where you can do these kinds of things. The colleagues, you know, um, and just the, you know, c coming in again, talking about father, both fathering and father Lawton, you know, having the sense of, I'm old school as an academic. Like I want my academic leaders to be you know, senior scholars, and my gang's a very, very well respected historian. You know, Bob Lawton has a Harvard PhD in Near Eastern languages, probably the most useless sort of PhD you can have, <laughs> but it's like this. That scholarship, that's this kind of, you know, you can read, you know, Northwest Semitic and Ugaritic and Hebrew and do those kinds of things, and this is why that's important. And, you know, frankly, just to be completely uh, uh, honest, was, you know, I understood that in the state system, you always have to defend why the study of religion is important, even in <laughs> California, even when it's uh, Islam in North America. I knew that at the Jesuit school, I'd never have to explain to Father Ang or Father Lawton why religion, theology, is uh, uh, important. You know? And so it's, it's just been a delight to be here. And like, it's one of those funny moments. I, say, since I show this to my students. If you'd asked me when I graduated in you know, 1997 with a PhD from the University of Toronto, do you see yourself teaching in a Catholic Jesuit university? I would have said, why would I be a Catholic university? I'm not Catholic. Only Catholics go to Catholic. Universities in Los Angeles. Why would I move to Los Angeles? Toronto is a great city. Twenty years later, I can't imagine a better place to be than right here at this Catholic Jesuit University. Precisely because it's a Catholic Jesuit University that values you know, the kinds of things that I value. You know, you look at the uh, the last time of our mission statement: you know, the service of faith and promotion of justice. Not the service of the one true faith. Not the service of the Holy Catholic Church. The service of faith. And you know, I like to think that I contribute to that uh, mission, that that's something that this value in this kind of education that, you know, I never would have a had access to because my parents couldn't afford to send me to a place like this. Canada doesn't really have, you know, so, I mean, yes, there are some small schools in Canada, but for the most part, they're large public institutions. So I had no experience with small, private, religious places. And, and I say this, you know, with our provost uh, sitting here, this is a great place. You know, this is extraordinary. Uh, uh, place uh, in in terms of, of organization, structure, leadership. You know, I'm, I'm not talking particularly about you, Provost. You know, of course, I'm talking about you. But you know what I mean. Like I've been here with a number of presidents. I've been here with Bob Lawton as president, Dave Bircham as president, Matthew Snyder as president. You know, uh, uh, Mike Gang is my dean. You know, uh, Robin Kraft you know, as our dean. You know, uh, Ernie Rose, Joe Heligy, you as provost. So you know, there's been transition over those uh, 12 years. But it's been great. You know, I, I can't imagine a better place uh, to be for a Muslim to be teaching in a Catholic Jesuit University of Theology uh, department. OK. Any last question? If not, um, can you all join me in thanking Dr. Hussain? Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. And, yeah, there are there are a few points before we before we conclude. I also wanted to thank Kathy for the wonderful introduction. Thank you, Kathy. Um, thank you to our special guest, the provost. The provost is in the house, people. So. <laughs> and thank you to the library outreach team. That's Carol Ravy, that's Ali, that's Evie, and that's John Jackson. Thank you all. We can't do it without you. Once again, there are books for sale, feedback forms, if you do have them. If you could put them in this plastic box, we would really appreciate that as well. The bar closes at 7 o'clock. There's plenty of time to mingle. And thanks again, everybody. Have a good evening.